Hi, everybody. This is Kara Fitzgerald at New Frontiers in Functional Medicine. I would not be here month in and month out for the past six years without the generous support of our sponsors. And I want to tell you about them and please check out their websites and check their products out. Biotics Research. For over 40 years, the foundation of biotics research has been innovation and quality. Their goals remain unchanged. Innovative ideas, carefully researched concepts, and product development with advanced analytical and manufacturing techniques. Biotics nutritional products are of superior quality and effectiveness and available exclusively to healthcare professionals. Visit them at bioticsresearch.com. Integrative Therapeutics. Integrative Therapeutics is focused on inspiring a better lifestyle through better health. By providing meticulously formulated nutritional supplements and valuable resources, Integrative Therapeutics promises to enrich your patients and embolden your practice. Welcome to your Integrative Therapeutics. Find them at integrativepro.com. And finally, I want to give a shout out to my friends over at Rupa Health. They make lab testing easy, fabulous, doable for both you, the clinician, and you, the person being prescribed the lab, the patient. Consider using Rupa as just a super, super, super smart solution to all your laboratory needs. Visit them at rupahealth.com. Please be advised that this episode discusses the topic of suicide, which may be a sensitive and difficult topic for some of our listeners. If you or somebody you know is struggling with suicide ideation, please get help. In the U.S., that's calling 988 for the Suicide Support Hotline. Elsewhere around the world, please go to our show notes page at drcarefitzgerald.com, where we have international support links. Remember, help is always available. We hope that this episode may provide some insight and support for those of you who are struggling. Hi, New Frontiers listeners. We are covering the topic of professional burnout in this episode. Have you ever wondered whether you're suffering with full professional burnout or you fall somewhere on the continuum of signs and symptoms? As you'll hear in the episode, it is relatively common. I've experienced signs of burnout, as has my interviewee, Dr. Jonathan Prusky. Consider taking our science-based burnout quiz. You can access the quiz at drcarafitzgerald.com slash burnout. This is the same quiz that Dr. Prusky refers to in this episode and uses in his own practice. Consider taking the quiz while you're listening to the episode or download the quiz and use it in practice with patients uh, you're concerned to struggle with burnout. Again, you can find the quiz at drcarafitzgerald.com slash burnout. Hi, everybody. Welcome to New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, where we are interviewing the best minds in functional medicine. And of course, today is no exception. I am thrilled to be back with the brilliant uh, Dr. Jonathan Prusky. He and I podcasted back in 2020, and we will link to that podcast in our show notes, but I encourage you to check it out. It was one of the most I don't know, really kind of important and clinically actionable conversations that I've had. Specifically, it was on depression, anxiety, um, suicide, just a powerful conversation on how to approach that through a functional and naturopathic lens. So let me tell you about Dr. Prusky now, and then we'll jump into our topic today, which is on burnout, specifically physician burnout. Okay, so Dr. Prusky is the Chief Naturopathic Medical Officer at Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. His primary responsibility is ensuring the delivery of safe and effective naturopathic medical care to patients, as well as ensuring the safety and effectiveness of the medical training in the naturopathic program. His clinical practice focuses is primarily on the evaluation and management of mental health conditions. He spent over 20 years advocating for patients that wish to receive integrative treatment to improve their mental health. He was the first ND to receive Orthomolecular Doctor of the Year Award in 2010, and he was inducted into the Orthomolecular Hall of Fame in 2017. Dr. Prusky is the author of more than 60 scholarly publications and several texts, including Anxiety, Orthomolecular Diagnosis and Treatment, and the Textbook of Integrative Clinical Nutrition. I just want to tell folks that 
His book, Ortho um, Anxiety, Orthomolecular Diagnosis and Treatment, is why I brought him onto the podcast. Check the podcast out and really consider getting that book. It is a gem. It is very actionable, very clinically useful. Dr. Prisky, welcome to uh, New Frontiers. Welcome back. Hi, it's so great to be here, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you. It's an important conversation. I'm glad that you you pinged me recently with the idea that we needed to talk about it, and I appreciated it immediately. So but burnout, physician burnout, what we might be seeing in our community, integrative and functional medicine, um, for, first of all, just define what we're talking about here. Yeah, so burnout happens only in the workplace. So it's not something that we think of outside the workplace, though it has cascading effects in all domains of life. When we think about burnout, we think of diminished personal accomplishment. We think of emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. And those are the key three areas that happen, or I guess, get influenced in burnout. And if I can explain a bit more, so when we talk about emotional exhaustion, we're feeling tired, depleted, and not, I would say, rejuvenated at all by the work that we do. When we have depersonalization, we're disconnected. We don't feel like ourselves anymore. We probably become cynical in regards to our work. And then, of course, if you have those two things, it's going to be very hard to have a lot of personal accomplishment, but that's also what is diminished in burnout. So as you can see, it's a composite of these three domains. And as you can imagine, if you even have just one of the three domains, it makes work very challenging. If you have two of the three domains, you have burnout. If you have all three, that's just brutal. And I don't think we are as aware as we should be about burnout. And I think the public at large hears a lot about it, but they don't hear enough clinicians talk about what it is and how it impacts them and just the consequences of burnout in general. What, what's the prevalence? Yeah, so I'm going to read a bunch of statistics and then we can talk about it. Mm-hmm. So I'll just set the frame. And this, these are just U.S. statistics. But what's interesting is it was certainly on the rise. And during the pandemic, I think because things became a bit more insulated, it actually decreased a bit. But that's not the whole story. And I'll get into that in a moment. So let me start with some statistics. So if we think about, let's say, and let me just sort of get a bit closer here. In 2014, burnout basically was about, I don't know, 54.4% of all of all surveyed doctors. Think about that. Wow. That's an incredible, oh, that's huge, huge yeah. right? And then what we know is that as the years went on, it sort of increased. And work-life integration or work-life balance, that decreased. Mm -hmm. And then with the pandemic, there was a slight change where work-life balance got a bit better and burnout became a bit reduced. And I'll, I'll tell you about those statistics now. So let me just get to that. So essentially what happened is, is burnout, I think, reached about 38% in 2020. And then work-life integration basically increased. So doctors were finding themselves a bit less burned out and having more basically work-life balance, let's say. But that doesn't tell the story. What what really happened a lot is the doctors that were in the hot spots of COVID, burnout was exceptionally high. Like whenever there was a hot spot, whether it's New York City or elsewhere, burnout rates just skyrocketed, especially among the frontline physicians. So I think though overall, there was like this nice bit of improvement What we fail to recognize is that really isn't the real story. The real story is there was considerable burnout among those on the front lines, and they got significantly impacted. And the same in Canada as well. We had the same kind of ideas going on where doctors have a high degree of burnout. There was a bit of a reprieve, but then during the pandemic, certainly when you look at different types of clinicians or physicians, burnout rates increased. And overall, I would say burnout levels have increased in Canada. And I would say overall in the U.S., burnout is still as brutal as it always is. I mean, if you think of the general population who are non, say, healthcare workers, their levels of burnout are much lower. Their levels of work-life balance are much higher. But anybody who's dealing in healthcare, whether you're a physician or otherwise, your levels of burnout are higher and your work-life balance are lower. So, I mean, you'll always see that among people that aren't physicians or clinicians relative to those that aren't in these roles. So I've got a few questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly I can see like just 
this is a comment and then I have a couple questions. You know, when COVID hit us here at our clinic, the volume dropped. You know, we didn't have patient, we didn't have the patient base that we usually had. We actually had to pivot and 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 do some other uh, do some other work in our clinic for a period of time. So I could see that although that had a, a different kind of anxiety, it certainly was not burnout uh, related because we weren't we weren't carrying the same load. Um, here in the States, actually, I'm sure it's true in Canada as well, but a lot, so, so this, this prevalence of burnout has prompted a lot of physicians uh, to, tr to transition into our medicine. And I'm on faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine, I think that you know. And so we're primarily training doctors who um, are looking to find their passion in, in medicine again, and, and that fulfillment that they were expecting when they graduated school. In fact, one of the MDs in my office is kind of personifies that um, he was going to just leave medicine altogether. And because he's a brilliant physician, and I'm so grateful that he's here, Dr. Ken Lewin, he found functional medicine and transformed his existence. And I think that he's, I think he's really doing quite well. And he's established some really nice work-life balance here. Um, but are we, but I, so, so on one hand, we are an oasis, and I think we continue to be an oasis, but I want you to think about, you know, burnout in our space as well, and, and maybe, you know, you can talk about it now, but you can certainly sprinkle in those thoughts throughout our conversation, um, and you and I were talking before, and you said that we don't have statistics on our experience, but um, any of your thoughts, your anecdotal experience, I would love to hear, and, and, and you know, for listeners to this podcast, if you're in functional medicine, if you're um, a clinician or any allied health professional, I would love, you know, in the comments to hear, to hear your own thoughts on it as well. Um, and why, what, why, what's the cause of burnout? So there, I've just, I've thrown a bunch at you. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. And, and we'll, we'll get to that. So yeah, let's kind of go a step back a bit because the causes we'll get to, mm -hmm. let's think about what, what goes on. So when someone is struggling, let's say with just chronic stress in general, which happens to many of us, it taxes all of our reserves, whether that's our ability to function in life, with our family, with our relationships, at work, and in so many domains. And what happens is it certainly activates our neurobiological system. And in doing so, as you know, we get this heightened activation of our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, which puts out cortisol, and we'll get into that in a moment. We also get this activation of our sympathetic system, which puts out norepinephrine as well as epinephrine, but the norepinephrine plays a more critical part there. And what's interesting is when we think about that, we can relate that to burnout, because when you think of burnout, we get the same activation of this stress system, but it's very specific to our work environment. And in both situations, we would probably see a very similar neurobiology. For example, in chronic stress, we know that there's a part of our brain that connects our right and left hemisphere. It's the corpus callosum. But what sits anterior to that is this anterior cingulate cortex. And that assesses our degree to whether future events are certain or uncertain. And when people are under a lot of chronic stress, they can't find certainty. And because yeah. of that, that activates our limbic apparatus. And in doing so, we really have much more bottom-up control than top-down control through our prefrontal cortex. So essentially, we get this flipping of our regulatory system, and we're driven too much by our emotions when we're chronically stressed. And what's even more damaging is when we think of all the chemicals that get released, we know that within our hippocampus and our prefrontal cortex, the actual neurochemical changes cause atrophy of the dendrites. And in doing so, it undermines both memory and decision-making and all the things that we see as valuable as being human beings with this complex brain that we have. And then what happens to our limbic system, in particular to the basolateral amygdala, there's this dendritic expansion that makes us more hypervigilant, more prone to anxiety and more aggressive. And that's with just chronic stress. But a bunch of researchers said, okay, we know that. What actually happens in burnout? What happens in burnout is something very similar. Our prefrontal cortex goes completely offline. That's also what happens in PTSD, which is extraordinarily interesting. And then mm -hmm. what also happens as a consequence of that is that there's an outpouring, not just of norepinephrine or even cortisol, there's an outpouring of dopamine. And apparently the norepinephrine mm -hmm. and dopamine 
because they dysregulate our higher brain functions, they actually help our lower brain areas like our amygdala, our limbic system, our brainstem, even the striatum, they become more strengthened in burnout. And as a result, again, you see too much bottom-up control, not enough top-down control. And again, the prefrontal cortex is offline. Now, what are the implications of that? Now, that's the scary part. When yeah. doctors are going through burnout, let me just read you all these implications because it's harrowing. So because your prefrontal cortex goes off offline, you're more forgetful. You have limited concrete thinking. As a result, you're more likely to make medical errors. You have less, your concentration is, is more deficient. You're more disorganized. So you find it challenging when you're multitasking. You have diminished decision-making. So your patient care is going to be subject to that as well as more medical errors. You have limited insight, poor judgment, impaired moral conscience. So you actually have lack of professionalism. That is, you're more vulnerable to that when you're going through burnout. Reduced empathy and compassion fatigue. So you can have communication problems with patients and coworkers. Diminished optim op diminish optimism and drive. As a result, you're more cynical, reduced work engagement, and so on. So you can see when our prefrontal cortex goes offline from burnout, all the effects can be incredibly damaging. And then when you couple that with the experience of burnout, a lot of doctors not only fail to meet the demands of their work environment when they're burned out because of all the above, they also can be subject to all sorts of other issues that only compound the problems more. So if you think about COVID, a lot of clinicians had moral injury. And if we define a moral right. injury, what, what it, it's defined as is you're put in a situation of having to make ethical decisions of a moral nature that you were ill-qualified to make because your training didn't prepare you to make them in the first place. So imagine now you're faced with two patients who are going to die and you have to basically triage care towards one over the other because of COVID. Or you have to disallow people seeing a dying relative because they're not allowed in hospital. Or you have to disallow relatives to see the birth of a baby because, again, there's all sorts of other requirements. So COVID brought about more burnout, more moral injury. And on top of all that, the neurobiology made everything just devastating because of what I just mentioned, because you just lose that capacity to have good judgment, good reasoning, and you just don't feel like yourself anymore. So it, it's a massive issue. and. There's all sorts of drivers, which we'll get into, but I think every healthcare profession, including us that are in the integrative realm, when we're pushed to a certain degree and we're faced with obstacles that we weren't really prepared for, then all of what brings joy to us from our work and from our connection to our patients can basically be more or less depleted over time. And then what happens as a result is we have an increased capacity to make a lot of mistakes or make poor judgments, make poor calls, or even risk our own lives. For example, during the pandemic, there was quite a lot of news stories about physician suicide. One in Canada, I can just read you the headline. This came from the Globe and Mail, January 12, 2021. Coronavirus, Quebec doctor's death by suicide sends shockwaves through Canadian, Canada's medical community. And this was a dev this is a young ER physician who was ill equipped because of just not only the moral imposition of having to make all sorts of calls, but just the sheer volume of patients that I'm sure she was never prepared to deal with during the pandemic. Put on that with all sorts of other vulnerabilities and moving parts that I'm sure happen in everybody's life. I feel terrible for what happened. She she took her own life. Same in New York. Here's the headline from the New York Times. This was Feb, uh, April 27th, 2020. Top ER doctor who treated virus patients dies by suicide. So what we have to realize is burnout isn't inconsequential. It's totally consequential. And when people are pushed, they have this moral injury, they're faced with situations they never prepared for, the end result is devastation. And when you think about the US in total, and I think this may surprise you, 132 people in the US die by suicide every day. That's just horrible. One of those is a doctor every day. Every day wow. in the US, a doctor takes their own life. And mm -hmm. I would include naturopathic doctors in there, functional medicine doctors, any kind of doctor. So that is just unbelievable when you think about it. So yeah. we're particularly vulnerable because we care so much about doing the job. And we're so vulnerable because we are going to be faced with all sorts of situations we couldn't be prepared for. Well, and early in COVID, we didn't know what the heck we were doing. 
Exactly. Like so, at all. Right. We didn't even know what treatment to give to no. people that wasn't solidified. So no. I can only imagine what it was like for, for doctors that had to make calls with a lot of insufficient information. Yeah, that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, all right. So, you know, how, I mean, it sounds like a war. <laughs> it just sounds like what you've described is a, is, is, is a war zone um, physically, emotionally, mentally. I mean, like, so I want to, I want to understand, um, and I know you're sort of building your case for this, but COVID notwithstanding, because that was such an outlier for us, you know, why, how this, how this develops. Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about that. So, so burnout develops because of the demands that we all face as clinicians. And I'm going to go through a bunch of them with you mm -hmm, right now. Mm -hmm. So for example, we all have time pressures and I would say clinicians in particular have a huge amount of time pressures at their job that always can increase our, our lack of personal accomplishment that could increase emotional exhaustion and certainly increase depersonalization. We also may be forced in all sorts of healthcare situations of doing things that we don't particularly enjoy. And if doctors actually don't do at least 20% of what they enjoy on any given day, that increases the risk of burnout. And that's so not I, a lot. 20%. No, it's not. I know. But if it's not uh, at least 20%, burnout goes up. And wow. regrettably, because of all sorts of metrics that different healthcare organizations yes. have, all sorts of demands, all sorts of policies and rules to follow, legislation mm -hmm. changes, yes. it, it sucks some of the joie de vie, the joy of being a clinician away from practicing people like myself and you. Yeah, 100%. and that certainly has consequences. If you and you're working, I mean, if you can have if you have thoughts on economics to fold in there, I would like to hear that. But certainly, you know, the economics and you know, and what you're talking about, the increased paperwork and regulation, um, is, is just so challenging here. I'm sure it is true in Canada as well. But you hit something really, I think, important: economics. So. A lot of clinicians, when they do their good work, they're not rewarded for it. But what they're forced to do is to actually do things that save their organization money. Yeah. And, and that's also a very challenging thing. How do you provide good care and also save an organization money? That also increases stress and increases the vulnerability towards burnout again. And then there's so many other things that are related to that because clinicians often have insufficient sleep, which also pushes them more. They also work a lot of hours and there's been a lot of interesting data on hours. So if you work 40 or more hours, the, it, the, the basically development of burnout goes exponentially up several fold. And many doctors work over 55 hours a week. And in doing so, that just escalates the chance of them developing burnout. So the odds ratio goes up several fold when you basically exceed, I would say, 40 hours, but then exceeds even more in terms of the odds ratio when, you, when you're 55 hours and up. That's a huge thing. And then think about the medical culture, right? So presenteeism is an issue. We all feel like we should never take days off. I was obsessed with never being someone who took a day off when I started my career. And basically this notion that we have to be present even when we're suffering ourselves goes against basically what good care should be all about. We should be able to take care of ourselves. But because that's part of medical culture, that creates all sorts of problems. So is hiding weaknesses. A lot of doctors may struggle with all sorts of health problems and psychological problems as the human race does. And as a result, because they're not willing to reach out, they'll hide their weaknesses and it will impact them considerably. That's another factor in burnout for doctors. The other one is evidence-based medicine. Did you know that medical information apparently doubles every 72, maybe 73 days? So the public <laughs> expects us to practice evidence-based medicine, but to keep up with the evolving literature base, and just the sheer amount of information that's being sent out on a daily basis, it's impossible. I would have to literally stop practicing and it would probably, I'd never catch up if I just spent the rest of my life reading 
before I passed away, I would never be able to catch up. So just the demands of evidence-based medicine are huge. And there's a lot of pressures in doing that relative to clinical experience. And yet clinical experience, I would say, is even more vital in a sense than evidence-based medicine. And then what else can I say? Also, you know, there's, there's maladaptive behaviors that doctors learn that increases burnout. Through our own training, a lot of doctors get mentored and their mentorship may actually encourage volatile, adversarial, even bullying type of behaviors that they're not aware aren't really acceptable. Of course, we know now more than ever, those kinds of behaviors are not acceptable, but these maladaptive behaviors are unfortunately transmitted through training and education. That also increases burnout, which is not insignificant. And then there's all sorts of interesting data that almost 50% of the time that a doctor spends on their EHR, electronic health record, or EMR, electronic mouth re uh, medical record, occupies half their days. Think about that. So you have all these patients, but then you're spending half your day on the computer. And then generally that trans translates into one to two hours outside of work just to finish notes. So that's, that's a massive trigger because not only are you put through the ringer trying to keep up with the computer during the day, so all your notes aren't overwhelming at the end of the day, you're probably spending another one to two hours after your hours with patients just to finalize things. And it probably could be more. So those are massive triggers. And I think every healthcare professional, including naturopathic doctors, has to contend with that. Absolutely. And I would say when COVID hit, I knew my job pretty well, but then I had all these other demands in my own job and it was brutal. And I'm not even a frontline healthcare worker, but just because we had more government requirements, more reporting requirements, more, um, I would say, screening, all these things came into play in a way that we never had to un it basically put them into action before. And that just created all sorts of increased stress for me, other people in my organization. So I think everybody faced unusual circumstances, but I don't think even since COVID is essentially over, at least the acute, let's say the acute, now we're in the chronic phase, let's say, I, I still think we're subject to a lot of pressures, such as those that I just mentioned, that will always put us at risk of, of being vulnerable to burnout. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not going to get better. Like with all of what I said, it's only going to exist in greater proportions, given just the, the sheer complexity of the work we do and the challenges that we face. Well, then what's the solution? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get there. But, but I do want to highlight a, a few yeah. other facts that I think are important. So some people think that burnout is a separate entity. I would put forth the argument that burnout is just depression within an occupational setting. And, and when you think about depression, it's mired in a lot of what is known as negative affect, where you just don't think in a positive way, just to make it simple. You're thinking very cynically, you're thinking pessimistically, and that can all come under this negative affect. It's like a dysphoric way of being. And when you think of depression, it's high in negative affect. Well, so is burnout. The other thing about burnout, which is really interesting, is there's some good data. I would say it needs to be far more expanded that shows that people with burnout relative to controls, they have lower levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Same with depression. Isn't that okay. interesting? So both are characterized by low levels of BDNF. And as you know, with BDNF, it's critical to our basically brain plasticity. It's like this unbelievable soil that helps our brain function the way it ought to. And in depression and burnout, they're both low. The other thing we see with depression is the prefrontal cortex is, is essentially not functioning well. Executive decision-making is poor. And same with burnout, as I mentioned, it goes offline. And then the whole limbic system, particularly the amygdala, is heightened in depression. And the same in burnout. So I personally think burnout is just a form of depression that ha happens within an occupational setting. That's why I think when it gets so severe and, and sometimes people are feeling like, no hope is, is available. That's why suicide can happen because yeah. depression and suicide are regrettably connected. Mm -hmm. And then because burnout to me is a form of occupational depression, therefore yeah. that doesn't surprise me that suicides happen. Yeah, no, I think when you catch it like that, it doesn't surprise me either. And there's a, a point of burnout where I would imagine intervention needs to be, you know, sort of all encompassing, like, 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 you know, it can be with, with depression. I mean, it's beyond just, 
sort of get out in the sun for a day. Like the, so the like a more aggressive approach is required when burnout really kicks in. Yeah. So if you want, do you want to talk about treatment? Um, or you have any? Uh, do you have any other questions before we get to that? Yeah, I do want to talk about treatment. I mean, you've you've you know you've you've highlighted the. Um, you know, the changes to the central nervous system that take place and correlated them to both depression and PTSD. I, I mean, I guess I'm curious about how we diagnose it, but all, but how we work with it. So I'm sure that you have some ideas for, with your background in using um, an orthomolecular approach to mental health conditions, how we could go there. But I'm, I'm, I'm also interested in lifestyle. I mean, and I'm interested in more, more broadly, like how the heck do we deal with this? Hello and thanks for listening. Metabolic Maintenance, a family-owned company for almost 40 years and a trusted leader amongst healthcare practitioners like Dr. Fitzgerald, has earned a reputation of excellence by producing pure, excipient-free, professional quality supplements. Their popular nutraceutical MethylPro offers superior L-methylfolate products supporting cognitive function, healthy neurotransmitter production, and a balanced mood. Use promo code KF. Two, three, and receive 20% off your next order at either metabolicmaintenance.com or methylpro.com. Healthcare providers have trusted Dutch for years to discover the root cause of hormone-related issues with actionable results backed by peer-reviewed and validated research. New research in the November edition of the journal Menopause now shows that dried urine testing is also effective for monitoring hormone replacement therapy. This exciting new study is one of the many validated papers Dutch relies on to help providers navigate tough treatment decisions with confidence. Learn more about Dutch testing and our commitment to following the science at dutchtest.com research. Hey there, listeners. It's your host, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. I have a question for you. How much time do you spend ordering functional lab tests for your patients? I bet it's a lot. Ordering from multiple lab companies for hundreds of patients can quickly turn into hours of admin time. But there's a new way to order lab tests I'm excited to share with you. Rupa Health is a tool that lets you order from over 30 specialty labs in a single portal. You can order all the tests you normally do from companies like Dutch, Vibrant, Genova, and Great Plains, and so many more. Imagine you're ordering a hormone panel for a patient that includes tests from three different labs. You have to log onto three different websites, place separate orders, come back weeks later to check on tracking numbers, download results, et cetera, et cetera. Rupa eliminates all of that by having all ordering, tracking results in a single place, and they also handle invoicing, uh, tracking shipments, automated follow-ups, personalized instructions for completing tests, and much more. The best part about Rupa is that it is free for you. Go to rupahealth.com, that's R-U-P-A health.com, and join a live demo or sign up to see how it works. Now let's get back to today's show. Yeah. So start so, where you want and, 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 and go forward. All right, that's terrific. <laughs> so diagnosis, there's a Maslach burnout inventory. There's sort of an expanded version, but a lot of studies use a short version that just essentially looks at depersonalization and I think emotional exhaustion. And if you're sort of strong in one or both, that's considered enough for burnout. And often there's a very significant correlation between the two item inventory of the Maslach burnout inventory to the larger one. So essentially you could use either one, but if someone is coming to you and they're expressing basically all those three elements, it's probably pretty easy to to say that they have burnout. Now, it's not a clinical diagnosis per se, but in the ICD sort of system, the, the international classification of, I think, diseases it's called, they do have a, a basically criteria and a listing of burnout. Now, it's not a formal diagnosis, but it is something that can be given to somebody uh, in a clinician's office. So it, it is changing. I think eventually it should find its way into the DSM, but as of now it hasn't, but it's very real. And I guess a lot of diagnoses may be made in lieu of burnout, like an adjustment disorder, for example, 
or major depression, for example, just to make sure people can get the treatment they require. But ultimately, we should have a separate category, I think, that distills all the key elements of burnout so that we can give it as a formal diagnosis. And when I work somebody up who has, and I've seen quite a few people with it, I do all the things that any good doctor does, a good history, a mental status evaluation. I dig into all the antecedents, all the things that have happened as a consequence. And we try to have a really good and useful conversation as any doctor would, because the best thing you can do to somebody who's sitting in front of you in despair is to be available, to show humility, curiosity, compassion, and to listen. And if people aren't given any time to talk about what's happened to them and to process just the nature of their overwhelm, I think we'll be underserving these, these people. And I'm, the, I'm that person, so are you. It wouldn't take much for me to become the patient who's having burnout if enough happens in my life. And I feel I've had burnout before, and it's an awful place to be because the abject depression and the abject cynicism and lack of personal accomplishment that happens is so defeating that you feel like you're almost a pretender in your own job that you were once feeling quite skilled at. It's, it's just an awful feeling to return to something that you feel such a disconnect with. So I feel for anybody with burnout because I certainly understand it from a mm -hmm. personal perspective. And it's, it's just harrowing and awful to go through it. I want to hear, yeah, I'm just curious how you moved out of it. And I think, I feel like I've had moments that I've touched on it um, with too much from all sides, <laughs> too much coming in from all sides um, and needing to back away from my work, which I've been able to do at, at, at different pivotal moments in my, in my career. Um, I want to just note to listeners that we will link to the um the two evaluations that you use can you just say the names of them again yeah there's a maslach burnout inventory and there's even another one i should say which mm -hmm. is the maslach you have to get a license for it so okay. there's one called the oldenburg burnout inventory which you don't and i'll make sure that you get that information it's Good. excellent as well and they're all very similar they all measure similar domains and they all have cutoffs so that you would easily know that someone meets a threshold to be diagnosed in addition to your good clinical evaluation. Okay. So we'll listen. Yeah. We'll just link to that content that, so people can read about it and have access to those uh, evaluations should they be interested. I, so let me just ask you this before we start talking about the intervention. Um, can outside, so it's, it's, so burnout is by definition occurring within the workplace, but can your risk for establishing burnout be increased with stress outside of the workplace i would so assume you're going, so so you're going through a divorce and then work becomes really hard i mean thoughts on that i think you're right i think it's chicken or the egg either work starts becoming brutal and you have burnout or your life outside of work is so brutal that it sort of permeates into your work and therefore you start having all sorts of issues with your work as well which then can clearly lead to burnout too so i think there's multiple ways that we can go from not having burnout to burnout. And I think everything matters. That's mm -hmm. why it's important that we do have work-life balance as clinicians, because there's so many pressures on us that are unusual for a lot of people. They just don't quite understand the different pressures. Even though I don't deal with emergent issues or acute medical issues, it doesn't mean that what I deal with isn't pressure-filled and stressful and demanding, all yeah. the above. I just have the same EHR, EMR demands that other doctors do. I have the same pressures because patients expect a lot when they see someone like me as they do with you. And we have a lot of moving parts, a lot of emails, phone calls, paperwork. It just doesn't go away. So if we don't manage that well, we all are unfortunately going to lean towards this outcome. And we need to do better at, at managing our lives so that we can mitigate against this happening. But if you want, we, we can talk about treatment because I think yeah. I'll get to the lifestyle part, which I think is yeah. the most important. So when you think about what stress does, we know that it certainly creates its own situation of depleting micronutrients. And there's many ways that that happens. So we get this increased oxidative stress and inflammation. We have increased urination and sweating that can happen, increased cortisol output appetite changes. So there's lots of things that happen when we're stressed that compromise our micronutrient environment. And if you think about Bruce Ames, the great Bruce Ames, he developed this triage theory, 
which says that when we're going through stress, which clearly can impede our body and our brain, our body basically mobilizes all the nutrients towards life-saving measures. But as a result, we're going to have cascading effects on our neurobiology. So when I think about burnout, you have to realize that because it shifts our neurobiology, because we're thinking that we're going through something that is almost life-threatening, all of our micronutrients are used to support our survival, but they're not being used actually to combat what's actually happening. That's why I think micronutrients can actually be quite helpful. And the ones that I think are particularly useful are very simple ones. B vitamins, vitamin C off the bat. There's probably now about four or five good clinical studies on just B vitamins at very low doses, sometimes combined with some minerals, sometimes combined with herbal medicines, sometimes combined even with a bit of vitamin C. And they're not high doses, but across the board, they're all showing lower perceived levels of stress, lower symptoms of depression and anxiety. So though these aren't studies on people who are burned out, we can look at that information and apply it reasonably to a situation of burnout. So that's a simple thing. But then there's even more compelling data, which I think is fascinating on broad spectrum micronutrients or broad spectrum minerals and vitamins. There's been a lot of data on that over the last 20 years on all different types of neuropsychiatric issues. But the data that I'm particularly interested on in is the data on PTSD. So they've used broad spectrum minerals and vitamins to support people who have PTSD from natural disasters. And what they found is just loading them up on broad spectrum micronutrients, just to make it simple for me to say it, actually helps considerably, again, on their perceived levels of stress, whether it's 28 days of treatment or six weeks of treatment, and it reduces symptoms of depression and anxiety. And the theory behind that is when you just upregulate all these micronutrients, because you're not doing a one a day vitamin, you're doing either four or eight pills a day. And believe it or not, four pills of broad spectrum micronutrients did better than eight. So there seems to be a, a sweet spot there, and at least from those studies. Hmm. But clearly what it's doing is it's probably optimizing certain biochemical pathways. It probably has its own pharmacological effects. It's probably mitigating inflammation. It's probably mitigating oxidative stress. And it's probably just giving us more of what we require because when we're under stress, we probably can't meet the dem demands of our needs just from diet alone. But I do think micronutrients can play a good role. I don't think it's the end all be all, but simple things, B vitamins, vitamin C, broad spectrum micronutrients, all those things have value. Let and me just we, ask you, let yeah. me ask you when you move, because broad spectrum mi micronutrients, are you talking about a well-designed multivitamin? Exactly. A well-designed okay. multivitamin that you don't take one a day. Yeah. You take four to four pills a day. And that seems to be the sweet spot, at least from the two studies that I think have value to translate to helping people with burnout. I mean, it seems to me magnesium would be in this somewhere. Absolutely. So okay. either you're going to get a reasonable amount of magnesium from four pills a day, or you're not. And I would think that you're not. So I agree with you. And you probably should be giving people extra at least four to 800 milligrams at some point throughout the day, or maybe at bedtime. Yeah. And absolutely, when you think of what magnesium does and all of the different biochemical reasons to give it, it, it makes complete sense. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. And then some herbal medicines that I think are fundamentally important would be rhodiola, rosea mm -hmm. extract. And there are actual studies on rhodiola helping with burnout. It's one of the few herbal huh. medicines for which data does show that it actually can help. So there was a 12 week study where they gave 400 milligrams a day to a population of people with burnout relative to controls. And clearly that 400 milligrams a day, if I'm remembering the dose correctly, had real value with cortisol modulation and symptoms of burnout. There was another study on fatigue. I think it was only 28 days or, or maybe 30 days, a lot less. But again, not only did it help with fatigue, and I think the dose was closer to 600 milligrams, and these are standardized extracts, mm -hmm. it actually helped again with symptoms of burnout. And as you know, with rhodiola, it modulates the HPA access. It probably has monoamine oxidase inhibiting effects. It probably does other things as well because it can activate us. It can take us from a low mood to probably a better mood. So it has a lot of value. I don't think it's it's poorly tolerated by most. Rhodiola seems to be well tolerated, doesn't cause a lot of nausea if you take it with food. And I don't think it should be combined with SSRIs or SNRIs. There have been a few reports of 
tachy tachycardias or issues where people actually had to go to the hospital when rhodiola was combined with SSRIs or SNRIs. So I don't typically combine the two. I'm, I'm very nervous about that. And then ashwagandha. To me, ashwagandha represents probably one of the best treatments for burnout because it modulates cortisol. There's at least three different trials now of healthy stress people that have found that it lowers cortisol by five units from baseline. So that would be uh, basically micrograms per deciliter, I believe. And that's incredible. So you start off with a certain value and three different studies show that reproducibly, it lowers it by five points at least over the course of say 60 days, which is amazing. And the dose of ashwagandha that does that is a, not a high dose. It's usually a dose that gives at least 30 milligrams of withanolides a day, usually on good products that comes to two pills a day. And that's fairly easy for most people to tolerate. But the other benefit of ashwagandha is that it brings more limbic resonance. It actually helps quiet down that area that gets overly activated in burnout and in depression. And in doing so, it gives us better top-down control. So it has some real value and it's very well tolerated. Very few people have any issues, i.e. increased transaminase levels from ashwagandha, though you, you have to tell your patients that's a rare possibility. Other than that, I, I think it's very well tolerated, has good utility. But the lifestyle is what you mentioned. To me, it's the most important. And well, before before we jump into sure. that, I just want to summarize. So, so a protocol that you would do could be the a, a, you know a well designed multivitamin, additional magnesium at bedtime. You would use rod rhodiola and ashwagandha together, um, but contraindicated if they're on SSRIs or SNRIs. Yeah, I would use them together or sometimes separately. It depends on the patient. Some patients get a bit of pill fatigue. Mm -hmm. and they don't want to take too many things. I take a lot myself. I don't worry about pill fatigue. I'm an aggressive <laughs> prescriber, I would say, of a lot of natural medicines, but yeah. I have to recognize there are differences between what I'm good, what I'm capable of doing and what my patients will agree to. So you can com combine the two. That's a great combination. Or you can try each of these herbal medicines separately. And I think, I think this represents a very good foundational plan. Mm -hmm. But to me, it doesn't really help the problem. Well, one more question before we we go right into sure. lifestyle. Magnesium. Now you're a big fan of glycinate um, yes. or glycine. Glycine yes. as a standalone amino acid. Would you prescribe magnesium glycinate? I mean, do you have a particular magnesium you like? Yeah, I always use the magnesium bisglycinate unless someone okay. has constipation in which I like magnesium citrate because you can help them with their magnesium, I would say intake as well as facilitate better bowel function and people who just find it hard to have a regular bowel movement every day. But the bisglycinate is great. As you know, glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It also calms the brain. It works very much like GABA, though it's not GABA, but it works like GABA. And when you combine magnesium with glycine, it's a very good combination. And magnesium by itself antagonizes the NMDA receptor system. So it calms down that excitatory system in our brain. It certainly is part of all of our energy producing reactions in the body that generate ATP. So it's also very important. It also is good to reduce muscle tension. It, it has so, because it relaxes smooth, I would say it's a calcium channel blocker to make it simple. Mm -hmm. So it has so many benefits that I just give magnesium to literally everybody, unless there's some clear contraindications, which thankfully there are very few. Very few. Yeah. I want to, I just, I, I, you know, your book, I know I have it like right over here. I kind of feel like showing it if I can find it. I but... have an update, you know, that needs a massive <laughs> update. You mentioned it the first time we spoke and I feel guilty. I mean, it, it would have to go through a massive revision to be quite honest. Well, you know what, though? I mean, I think there's enough foundational naturopathic interventions in there, like your botanical, your, but you talk about rhodiola in there, don't you? Do, do yeah, you mention it? And you talk so. about ashwagandha. I mean, you, magnesium, glycine. I don't think I talk about ashwagandha. That was before, no. you know, I was aware of all the studies okay. and good information. But, but yeah, this was from, I think, 2006. So it, it needs a revision. Listen, I hope that you revise it. <laughs> I, I mean, that would be fabulous. And, it's unique in that it it gives dosing instructions and how, you know how to use these different interventions in a very realistic way. And I find that a lot of books out there tend to be way, way, way too conservative. But you know that's your your book is really one of my favorites for that very simple reason. I think it's real world, you know, efficacious um, instructions. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I always think like I'm always a clinician first, and I've always thought that way, and that's really all I care about. I've been involved in doing some studies like randomized studies. And to be honest, it's not my thing. I, I love reading them when appropriate, but doing them is just brutally hard. You have to overcome so much 
institutional and bureaucratic inertia and even government inertia if there's government requirements. So I'm just not a fan of, of conducting them, but I love as a clinician trying to translate information and make it valuable and useful to the to the people like us who really care about helping people. Yeah, and you I think you succeeded in doing that. So yeah, maybe a bit of a chestnut at this point, but there's still useful information. Um, so I want to encourage people towards Thank you. Um, towards looking at it. Okay, so let's really get to the meat and the potatoes of this, as it were, like talk about lifestyle. And that's the heart of the treatment for burnout. So what do we need to do? Yeah, so I mean, I, I thought about this a lot. And, and there's, there's a few moving parts here. So everybody knows that sleep, exercise, eating well, and I'm sure there are other and meditation, all those are, are fundamentally important. And there's no clinician out there that wouldn't recognize that those are helpful. The problem is no institution that I'm aware of cares enough. So they put the burden to find treatment on the actual individual. Like they're, they're, they're so ready to punish an individual for a mistake that's made because of burnout. But there's very little help to prevent burnout in the, in the beginning for the very clinicians that are doing good work for all sorts of organizations and the people they serve. So it's a bit crazy, the certain situation. And I don't know of many organizations that care enough to change the culture of how they do things to really support their doctors and their clinicians and all the hardworking people. So without question, all these foundational elements are important, but I, I look at it a bit differently. So and I look at the work of the late Dr. Viktor Frankl, mm. who was a hero of mine. I mean, I've yeah. done a lot of my own work on existentialism and existential psychotherapy. And as you know about Viktor Frankl, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. He was a psychiatrist and neurologist and a PhD, as well as a physician, obviously. And he survived the Holocaust. And what he did, though, was the Holocaust only reinforced his ideas about meaning and purpose. So he didn't develop these because of his experience in having survived the Holocaust. He came to the Holocaust with a massive amount of knowledge already solidified and going through the experience and having survived, it only made him believe more in a lot of his ideas. Wow. So when I think about helping people through burnout, it's not just those lifestyles. It's about helping them to define meaning and passion for the work that they once had, right? So let's talk about that. So when you think about Viktor Frankl, he says one of the ways of helping people is to remember that you're doing a good deed. So when you're sitting across from somebody and they're starting to rebuild their life again, remind them that what they're doing is good for humanity. They're doing good for people. They forgot that. They become cynical. They become more depersonalized. They're exhausted. So when we think about doing a good deed for other people, that can build our energy up. That's a wonderful thing, right? That's one thing that is incredibly helpful, just to remind people of the good work that they're doing. They've lost that, that connection. And I think that requires a really good conversation and maybe multiple visits just to help somebody to connect again with the goodness of their work. The other thing that Viktor Frankl talked about in helping people was love. And I think what's happened is burnout is a one-sided affair. When anybody has burnout, basically what it tells me is they've been more in work than in home and in love and in connection to the people that are most important. And when we have love in our life, it does so many wonderful things to us. And it saddens me when I see clinicians that have burnout, they put so much work into their work, mm -hmm. so much time to do good, and they're depersonalized, they're exhausted, they lack personal achievement. But what's happened is they're having a one-sided affair and their actual relationships have taken a dive they're neglected because they've put so much of their emphasis on their work life. And as a result, they forgot that they need to be more attentive to love and to the connections that are so important. So I think the other thing that helps people, and I put this under lifestyle, is to reconnect on an emotional level to the people that are most important. Because at the end of the day, my family is what sustains me. If I lost everything, but I had my family and I call them my little wolf packs, my wife, my daughters, that is what grounds me. They are going to be there through thick and thin more than thick and thin more th than anybody, right? They're what's most important to me. And everybody needs love in their life, no matter how it's defined. It doesn't have to be defined in any traditional way. We just need relationships that fill us up. And I've seen many doctors lose those relationships because they're burned out, because they've unfortunately committed adultery with their work. 
And that's devastating. That's the other side of burnout. We don't talk about how it basically destroys relationships. And the third thing is let's assume that you can change your work. Well, it would be silly if you're burned out to go back to a toxic work environment. So it may require that sometimes people have to literally quit a current job so that they can go to something that is less likely to be torturous for them. But if that can't happen, as Dr. Frankel said, sometimes if you can't change the circumstances of your existence, and he saw that profoundly in the Holocaust, and again, I, I don't want to make burnout the Holocaust. They're so different, and I wouldn't even say they're proximate in any way. I'm just using Dr. Frankel and his wisdom, that's all. But he says, we sometimes just have to change our attitude. And I can tell you when people are burned out, they're cynical, they look through a lens of just negativity, they see work as just God awful. But sometimes if we just adjust our attitude, we can start seeing that our work isn't as bad as we thought. And we can start again, finding it tolerable and then eventually finding it enjoyable again. So the three moving parts that I would say come from Dr. Frankel's. Remember that we're doing a good deed. Remember that love is highly important and that we shouldn't give up on that because we work so much. And that if we can't change the circumstances of our work, we can change our attitude. And all those require a lot of energy and effort, but those are fundamentally important because organizations, from my perspective, are doing very little to really help clinicians of any kind yeah. manage just the demands of their work. And until that happens, we have to take matters into our own hand. And, yeah. you know, organizations have employee assistance programs and they may offer free meditation. That's good. But that is not enough. If you don't change, change the organizational structure, you're not going to change how the person experiences work in the first place. And I think, unfortunately, the onus goes on to us doctors. Now, there are some unique situations, and this comes back to lifestyle. Would you know, and let me just find it in my notes here, there's an actual burnout ward. I think it's in Germany. Well, so if you're burned out in Germany, you're lucky you go for six weeks to a burnout ward. I don't know of any other country that does it. I may have the wrong country. And it's weird that I was talking about the Holocaust. Then I bring up Germany. Weird coincidence. But nonetheless, what's remarkable is they have a burnout ward. And when you go there, they give you coaching. You get, they, you get rest. So you get respite. It's incredibly important. You get massage and acupuncture. Mm. And and what's fascinating is they've done a study on this burnout ward. And when they leave, guess what happens? Well, they're feeling better after six weeks. Their levels of BDNF go up and they feel more like themselves again. I don't know of any other situation where that's possible. I would love to have called my work up when I was going through what I thought was burnout in the summer of 2021 and said, you know, can you please send me to a burnout <laughs> ward? And, and I continue to get my benefits and payment at the same time. Well, who has that luxury, right? If I took six weeks off, I'd lose six weeks of income. There's no way I can keep my family and the economic demands of my life going if I took six weeks off, right? Yeah. But in a country like Germany, they've somehow done it. And well, they've wars, placed a value. They've yeah, which is incredible. And I, I'm sure I'm a little bit yeah. wrong here, but I think I'm also right that, that there is that possibility there. But the study was fascinating. Six weeks, all those different resources, massage, acupuncture, coaching, group therapy, you name it. And to me, that's what we need. But yeah. until we actually get resources that are there to help people who have burnout and to prevent burnout by changing organizational structures, I think we're all going to be unfortunately vulnerable to this happening in the first place well, over and, and over again. To, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up Victor Frankl and it you know, I read his book so many years ago and I, but somebody recently sent it to me as a thank you for, 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 for something that we did. And um, it reminds me of just have cultivating gratitude. I mean, just, I love it. I mean, and it sounds like that's what he was doing. And if he had the ability to change his perspective in the Holocaust, like we can change it in burnout, you know? But he's yes. got the cred. Like if he was able to do it under those circumstances, then we can do it here. Um, sometimes before I see a patient, I need to get grounded and things are just really nutty. And I can tell him sort of in a, in a less useful place mentally, I take a moment of gratitude. And sometimes it'll be, I need privacy. It'll be in the bathroom. I'll just go down into the, into the bathroom and that's where I can get a little bit of space away from the chaos. And um, and just a moment 
to breathe and just to bring myself center and to remember that I'm doing good work for this human being who's who's coming to see me and asking me to walk with them on their journey and cultivating some gratitude that that I'm asked to do that and those little things go a long way, you know, and that's maybe 60 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, let me let me add something to that because it's so appropriate. And I and I forgot. So so thank you. I'm a huge fan of all different modalities. So I just want to read a bit. So what has been found is that cognitive behavioral therapy can help with basically depersonalization, which is interesting. Actually, no, emotional exhaustion. So cognitive behavioral. CBT has been specifically found to help with emotional exhaustion and then self-care, any kind of workshop that people can do for self-care has been shown to lower depersonalization. But the best thing that I like is mindfulness, self-compassion that comes from Dr. Christine Neff. And a lot of what I do with my own patients is mindfulness, self-compassion, which is much like gratitude, but it's, it's a bit yeah. different. What it does is it recognizes three different components. Number one, that there's a common humanity that we all share, that we're all imperfect, that we're all subject to making errors and problems in our life, and we're, we're not perfect. So there's a common humanity. The other part of mindfulness, compassion, or mindfulness, self-compassion is to treat yourself as a good friend would treat you. And the third part is to name the emotion without getting engulfed in the emotion. So to say, yes, I'm feeling anxious, and to give yourself the permission to feel that way without making it more than that without sort of letting it to be engulfed inside your whole being. And, and I'll give you a sense of how it works. So you, and there's always a touch component to mindfulness, self-compassion. You can give yourself a squeeze and give yourself a hug because that activates that caring system in our own body and oxytocin actually gets released when we do that, which further supports our self-regulation. So when I teach people mindfulness, self-compassion, I go through those three components, the common humanity part, naming your emotion, which is more mindfulness and talking to yourself as a good friend would. And, and it goes something like this, like, Hey, Jonathan, you're having a really rough time right now. And you know what? A lot of people struggle and, you know, I, I appreciate the struggle you're going through and it's very real and you're feeling anxious and it's okay. And you know what? I think you can get through it. And then you give yourself a bit of a squeeze, but it's like anything, if you don't practice it and don't really allow yourself to sort of get into that mind space, it won't work. So it is like gratitude, but it's a bit different, but it's really showing yourself the kindness and the acceptance of your imperfection and also some physical touch and some mindfulness too, in a way that I think a lot of things can't. And if it, it does work, and I can't tell you when people are finding themselves dysregulated from burnout, just understanding these components of mindfulness, self-compassion, doing a bit of work to, to get somewhat good at it and practicing it goes a long way to help in addition okay. to the other things that I talked about. So I think we're, 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 we're at the end of our time here, but I just, so it's a, so I, you know, the medical system in both of our countries um, is they're, they're in distress, you know, talk about experiencing burnout, you know, the way that we approach health in these countries. And well, in it's our, not it, health. It's, it's deeply, that's right. It's deeply, deeply, deeply flawed. So just this will foster you know, burnout and, and everything that we're facing. So there's this massive structural overhaul that needs to happen that's beyond the scope of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to recognize that. And it's also important to recognize that moment by moment, we can make choices to change our reality moment by moment. But this, it certainly, it gives me a deep appreciation for being in functional medicine, for being a naturopathic physician, for being in something that even as we have our own challenges, because we do, and burnout exists here, as you, as you mentioned, we have been away, an oasis um, providing a different, a different lens to treat our patients, but also a different lens to treat ourselves. There is, even as all of us can get caught up in, in poor self-care, there's a strong emphasis in our communities to walk the walk to actually be the person that you're espousing, you know, or that you want your patients to be. There is there is an effort on that. And I think that people will call us out, <laughs> you know, if 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 not, you know, if they if they if not. But we also do have to remember, as you said earlier, you know, that we're human, you know, that we're also human. So um everything, you know, everything I think needs to be 
embraced, but I do, I, I appreciate our community and the fact that we are trying to be a solution in what's an incredibly difficult, you know, difficult world. Yeah. And so, I don't, and I don't fault any of physicians who are in the system because it's a disease yeah. management system and they're doing the best they can. But if we yeah. wanted to change everything, as you said, a different conversation, but we have to truly embrace a healthcare system, a healthcare culture, and that has to trickle down to organizations, schools, et cetera. So that would be a yeah. step function change of the whole entire world in a sense. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. So we can do our part, as you said, within our community and hopefully that will impact other communities, which I believe it already has. That's right. That's right. And we will always welcome people into our world with open arms. Any any physician or healthcare provider interested in, in what we're doing can join us and walk with us. All right, Dr. Bruski, it was great to spend some time with you and your insightful, uh, you know, just your wisdom and, and, and passion around these important issues that need need some light on them. So thanks so much for joining me. New Thank Frontiers. you. Yeah, thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation. It's so nice to see you again. Thanks again. Yeah, likewise. As always, thank you for listening to New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, where because of my sponsors, I am able to bring you the best minds in functional medicine. And of course, today is no exception. Not everybody can be a sponsor on my platform. So I appreciate the good work, the relentless research, and the generous support from my friends at Rupa Health biotics research, and integrative therapeutics. These are brands I know and trust in my own clinic, and I can confidently recommend them to you. Visit them at rupahealth.com, bioticsresearch.com, and integrativepro.com. And please let them know that you learned about them on New Frontiers. And if it's not too much to ask, I would really appreciate a thumbs up or a kind review wherever you're listening to New Frontiers. Thanks.